So, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Xinwu, and I'm a final year PhD student here at Excel. And I'm also in the first cohort of our CDT. So I'm going to submit my thesis in September. And this is going to be a talk about my PhD research. And I hope you will enjoy the talk. So, uh, yeah. So more specifically, I'm going to talk about, yeah, like, a, a, as you can see, a new implicit representation how neural implicit representation can be applied in uh, 3D reconstruction and the SLAM. And, and then also how, how this neural representation can be applied in object level SLAM to, uh, to be used as a shape prior. And uh, finally, I will also talk about my recent work on real-time online semantic, semantic mapping. So, okay, so let's start. Okay, so before talking about uh, specifically my research work, uh, I'd like to make sure that everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say neural implicit representation. So, okay. So, uh, so to understand what what neural representation is, first let's see what are the uh, classical scene representations out there. So, so, so to represent a three D surface, so we have uh, here you can see we have a point cloud, which is simply a list of x y the coordinate on the surface, and we also have Fox grids. We are used to, you just store zeros and ones, just indicating whether the voxel is occupied or not. And also, also we can have tri triangle mesh, which not only saves the surface points, but also the connect connectivity between them so that we also have the topology of the surface. So the, the first three uh, representations are what we call explicit representation because we are, because we are actually explicitly saving the surface. And this is different from the, the last one. Uh, for example, we have a, the last one is called sand distance field or SDF grid. So this is like, like instead of ex, 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 explicitly encode the surface in each box, so we, we save its distance to the nearest surface. And in this way, the surface is actually presented as a zero, zero crossing of, of the, this box field. Oh, sorry. And uh, so here you can see that the, all those classical scene representations, they are first, they are discrete. And also to use those classical scene representation in the in 3D reconstruction or SLAM, you basically the problem is just a, it's just a simple forward computation pro, uh, process. You just, uh, you just put whatever your measurement tells you to the voxel, that's it. And, uh, and then that's the, and then here's our, yeah, our neural representation. So the and the, the most groundbreaking groundbreaking piece of work is this uh, neural radiance field in 2020. And the nerve. So the most fundamental difference between the classical representation that nerve uh, basically represents the scene as a single MLP. So uh, so when you query the so so. You can query that MLP with a XYZ location and also a viewing direction. And that uh, MLP will give you the, the, the density. So the, the density and also the RGB, the color at that point uh, with that viewing direction. And so, so in this way, the, the scene is represented, uh, re represented with a MLP implicitly. And uh, I think another very, like, a, Big contribution of this uh, this representation is that it is coupled with a, a fully differentiable volume render pipeline, so that you can so from this pipeline you can see that uh, with this uh, neural scene representation itself you cannot learn anything because it's three D. We don't have direct three D measurement, but if we have a fully differentiable rendering volume rendering, we can yeah we can sample rays uh, we can sample rays along the camera and then we can we can render uh, we can render a view uh, out of the our scene representation and we can compare our synthesized view and our actual uh, measurement measured view so this is the idea of how nerf is trained and uh, actually the yeah the result is quite amazing so here you can already see the some fundamental differences so first it's to use the neural network 
and also the, the reconstruction process is completely like reversed compared to the classical representation. So here the reconstruction process is an optimization process. And uh, and also here here's some like minor things I need to mention is that actually there are also some debate in the community that like this nerf type of representation should be categorized as neural field representation uh, instead of neural implicit representation because in because the term implicit here should refer to something like this representation, which I mentioned in the previous slide, like SDF. And also there are also some follow-up works that use not just a single MLP, but they take some hybrid form, like a feature grid, a feature grid coupled with a tiny MLP decoder to decode the final uh, geometry representation. And, but here I just uh, need to clar clarify that for simplicity and uh, with slight abuse of notation, I will call all those uh, method with neural network. I will call all, all those methods neural representation, and I will use neural representation, neural implicit representation, and neural scene representation. I will use them interchangeably. Yeah. And uh, so that's a brief introduction of uh, what uh, what neural implicit representation is. And uh, then I'm going to introduce the first paper. Uh, the first paper I'm going to present is the task is just a uh, given a set of the RGB and depth images. You, you just, uh, you just, uh, how can you achieve very high fidelity and accurate three D surface reconstruction? And using the using the nerve paradigm, just op direct op optimizing the scene representation. And here we use a uh, here we use a multi level feature grid and a tiny MLP decoders, and we represent the scene as SDF. Because one thing uh, we just mentioned uh, in nerve is that nerf you Nerf is using uh, density, so it's a very soft uh, representation. You don't have a clear uh, definition of where the surface is. So uh, in this sense, SDF is a better representation. And also the reason that we use a feature grid instead of a single MLP is that it is much faster to train. And our results show that. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, yeah, so let's see, uh... If you go on Zoom and then just click got it. On the screen, right? Sorry. Sorry. They're seeing my screen. They're they can see it on my laptop. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm really sorry. It wasn't like that online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I hope you, yeah. Maybe I just go back. This is the yeah, not too many slides. So this is a yeah, what I was talking about uh, in the classical scene representation, and uh, yeah, this is the nerve line. Yeah, and then this this slide, okay, and so yeah, and our experiments also show that the using a feature grid plus a tiny MLP decoder can reduce the training time from like twenty hours to twenty minutes. Okay, so yeah, the, the whole pipeline is very simple. So at each training iteration, we sample rates from the uh, from our, our RGB images, and uh, and for each rate, we also sample sample some points along uh, on it and uh, for each some points we all, well, we just query the feature in the feature grid uh, based on their 3d coordinate and uh, then we just uh, we just concatenate because we have multi-level uh, feature grid we just concatenated all the the features at a different level and uh, and here we also have a separate feature grid to uh, to encode the color information and once get, once we've got all the features, we just uh, we use two MLPs to decode directly into SDF and color. And uh, yeah, with this predicted SDF and RGB values, we are able to uh, formulate our final loss functions to optimize our scene representation, which is multi-level feature grade and also this MLP decoders. And we have and here we have six loss terms. Uh, Four of them are data term, and two of them are regularization terms. And I will, yeah, I will go through, go through this is the rendering losses. It's basically the idea is the same as you, know, you just to compare the difference between your measured RGB and depth Im images between your rendered values. And uh, here, one different thing is that because we we take a different representation, we were using SDF, so we have to to change the rendering equation accordingly to 
that to feed to the SDF pipeline. And uh, next, because we because we're using SDF, actually we, we have some other like uh, constraints that we can leverage to have uh, more direct supervision to the to each of the points. So inst instead of pixel level supervision, these are all points level pointwise supervision. So so this pseudo SDF losses consists of two uh, like two parts. So first, uh, for for near surface points, we we can have a yeah, we can have an approximate supervision. We can we can just approximate the SDF value because according to the definition, it's the the SDF is the distance to the nearest upper surface. And uh, imagine if the point is close enough to the surface, we can directly use the difference between the measured depth and the sampled value. Although it's not 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 a hundred percent accurate, but given that it's it's very near to the surface, this approximation is is accurate enough, and this is also basically widely used in some traditional algorithm like Kinect Fusion. And uh, so, for the for the points that that are further further away from the surface, we don't have uh, we don't have too much information. We don't have too much constraints to constrain their behavior. So we just uh, yeah, we just apply uh, this uh, this constraint to, to just a penalty. To just just apply very huge uh, expon exponential penalty to to negative SDF value, and uh, finally we also have two regularization terms to to improve the service smoothness and also in, encourage encourage the SDF predictions to be a valid distance field. So the smoothness term is just to. to yeah, the, the second one is smooth interpretation. So it's just to encourage the uh, the nearby points. They have uh, similar gradients, and the iconal the iconal term is just simply to to encourage that the gradient of the the SDF is uh, is of unit length. Okay. Yeah, and that's it. And here. Some reconstruction results on both real world and synthetic scenes, and this is flight through window on a scanet scene, and you can see our method can catch a very nice reconstruction result, and the smoothness is very. And we also compared against our baseline method. So this bundle fusion is a traditional method. You can see it's, uh, yeah, or is much smoother. And we also compared against uh, our closest baseline, which is also a neural method, but uh, using a single MLP. You can see our method. Oh, I think the video has finished. Yeah, but uh, you can see the the TV screen is much better. It's much smoother. And we also evaluate our our method on some synthetic data set, which for which we have ground truth uh, meshes. And here you can see that's our the whole filling ability, like our method has the best whole filling ability. Here you can see NeuroGPT can also like sort of fill the holes, but you can see it's very noisy. But uh, our method can, yeah, can heal like a perfect hole. Okay, and uh, although GoSurf can already achieve very nice results. And it is already very fast to train, but it still got some limitations. So first of all, it's an offline method, which which means you you need you need to have all the images all at once. So you cannot run run it in an online sequential manner. So this will this just uh, limit its like usage. And also, it's a I mean, it's a it's a pure mapping. It's pure reconstruction method. It's not slam. We 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 still need to get camera poses from let's say an off the shelf system or structure from motion method so and that's why we extend this similar idea to a full slam system so which is this paper we we call it post lamp and uh yeah i think these two i'm going just to go through it very quickly so in terms of scene representation we one difference is that we, we switch to a multi-resolution hash grid uh plus a one blob encoding which we which we empirically found to be like a, a memory efficient and have better whole filling ability, while, but it's also fast to train. And also 
as we're doing slam here, we're not just uh, uh, optimizing our scene, scene representation, but also the camera poses. So yeah, as we've as as we've we've discussed, the paradigm of of the like this new representation is, I mean, it's it basically is an optimizing process. So you can just uh, if you want to optimize camera pose, just add them to your optimizable parameter and optimize jointly. And uh, yeah, because it's a system, so there are, there are some like a decision, like a design choices we need to make. So we also made some. Uh, several improvement to the keyframe key frame selection and uh, bond adjustment strategy just uh, in this slide, but I don't think I have enough time to to yeah dive into too many details. So yeah, so if you are interested, please just uh, refer to our paper for more details. Uh, and uh, here's the yeah here's the demo of uh, coast lamp and our closest baseline nice lamp running on us. Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. I think the, the the one on the left is our baseline, and the one on the right is our method. And you can clearly tell that our method is reconstruction quality is much better. And uh, we also, sorry, and we also test on uh, a scan analysis that which consists of like a real world sequences. And again, our method is on the right, and uh, the stem is on the left. You can see our yeah, you can clearly see that the hole in nice clam is is much worse. Actually, that is not observed, but our method can like feel that region like uh, almost perfectly. Okay, so that's I think yeah, I think that's it for the uh, for the reconstruction slab. And uh, one thing uh, I need to mention is that so far we've we've just we've been just looking at capturing appearance and geometry. But but how about also capturing and understanding things at the level of object? Because object is very important for like a, let's say for uh, for embodied AI or for AGI, right? If the robot want to, if we want to ask the robot to do something, he need to know where is the chair, like where is the table, right? So and here. Uh, I would say the most popular work along this direction is this Max Fusion. And the actually the idea is very simple. And the trick here is to just leverage a 2D detector. And here they use a mask as and just to, to get the, the 2D uh, instance masks. And once it, once you've got the two uh, the 2D mask, you can just uh, the data association can be easily done. And you can just uh, you can just uh, track and uh, reconstruct each model separately. And here you can see that it can work fairly well. It, yeah, it is able to like a work with multiple objects and it is, it is able to detect the like human arm and just uh, regard it as outlier and uh, yeah but i think the the biggest issue you can also tell is that it is unable to reconstruct the non-visible part of the object like the teddy, teddy bear it's, it looks like a piece of paper so so what's behind it is empty so so the question is can we also do some tricks to also like reconstruct the non-visible part. Okay, and uh, yeah, so here comes the next paper I'm going to introduce is this DSP slab, yeah, which solves exactly that problem. Uh, so the so the trick here is to is to to leverage a pre pre-learned shape prior, and then we use that pre-learned pre-learned frozen shape prior at test time to fit our to fit our model to the to the observation. Okay. okay. And uh, so DeepSDF, yes, yeah, yeah, to briefly uh, talk about, yeah, DeepSDF is also a type of neural implicit representation. And it and it, it, it is even it, it even comes earlier than NERF. So so the difference is that DeepSDF is models SDF. So it's it's a surface, just 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 as in in GoSurf and Coastlam, we use SDF. So here you can see the uh, if you query a X Y Z location, it will speed out the SDF value at that location directly. But uh, but more importantly is that deep SDF also they also focus on like a uh, like a learn learn distribution over a over a number of objects and capture the shape variance of a 
like of all the cars of all the cheers. And what they do is that they propose to to have uh, this what they call auto decoder, like a training paradigm. So so where you you just train. Uh, let's say you have one thousand cheers in the dataset. You just uh, you just associate associate each cheer with a latent code, and when you train on those one thousand cheers, you not you not just uh, train the the weight of the network. So also you after training you also got one thousand latent code of each cheer, and with this way you can see that's why they call it auto decoder. There's no encoder, there's no encoder part. You can directly learn the this latent code through through like a optimization and then and with this trained uh deep staff you can have a very good like a representation of the a latent space of the shape and then and then we can use this very compact code to represent our shape and so at test time the the problem will become uh in terms of object reconstruction the problem will be Fairly easy. So imagine just to give an initial estimate of the shape code. So here we just use a, the initial estimate of code. Yeah, it, it can can be just a zero, a zero code, and also an, an initial estimate of the object pose. We can you know, we just need to iterate iteratively refine our est estimate of the latent code as well as the object pose, such that it fits our current observation the best. And here, the observation we can leverage, yeah, there are many. For example, we can use 2D bounding box. We can use 2D masks, and we can also take the take the depth, measure depth value on it, and then it, it will just become an optimization problem. So to uh, to construct the to construct the constraint for our optimization problem, the uh, yeah the first constraint we can leverage is this surface consistency. So the idea is very simple. So, so if we have a perfect shape and pose, the the and, and if we have a sparse depth measurement on the surface of object, so if we back project all those all those points and transform it to the object space, they should perfectly lie, uh, lie on the surface. And also according to the definition of SDF, they should have exactly zero values. So this is the first uh, uh, constraint we can use and we define it as a l2 norm because we yeah we define it as a quadratic term because we want we want to uh, we want to optimize it using second order uh, solver so it's faster for uh, for slam yeah and but this term alone is not enough so here here are two toy examples depicting why this alone is not enough so first there, there will be some shape ambiguity. So, in the in the top row, you can see. So, suppose the the uh, the blue curve is the actual surface, and you have you have several measurement on the surface, and imagine the the black surface is the is your initial estimate, and uh, you can see the the one in the middle, the the red curve also perfectly uh, will use like a zero surface loss. But of course, it's not what we want. And and apart from the shape ambiguity, we also have this scale ambiguity. In the in the bottom row, you can see that in in this example, because in some like in, in some in some cases, when we have when the observation, we, when we only have a partial observation, especially you can see here, we we only have like like two sides observation of this. This big car, and this uh, this this shape in the middle is it fits to this observation like uh, perfectly. It's, you can see it's too big. So, so uh, yeah, both those two two problem means that we cannot only use this constraint. And to to, to solve these uh, two problems, we can yeah the solution is very simple. We can just add a rendering term. Yeah, just a. Uh, uh, just as in Nerf, we, we just uh, render the apps, and uh, yeah. So in the in the top row, you can see the in the first problem when you have depths, depths, then the 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 supervision will be more direct than to than just to say that this point should have zero SDF. And uh, also for the second problem, 
when we when we do the rendering, actually we can leverage the silhouette to 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 penalize the object from growing too big. Okay, and so speaking of rendering, so this is just a yeah, actually this is just a almost exactly the same as the as the nerf rendering pipeline. You just uh, yeah, you just uh, integrate along the. So first you you, you convert the SDF value to uh, we apply a very simple conversion from SDF to occupancy, and once you've got the occupancy, you can you can just define all those probabilities and just uh, integrate along the array, and then the ex expected value will be the be the the render depth, and then, and again the render loss is also a quadratic quadratic term, and uh, here comes our final loss, which is the uh, like a way with, uh, with the sum of surface laws, rendering laws, and also a, a regularization term on the on the shape code. And uh, yeah, and for the for the Gaussian Newton solver and the Jacobian der derivation, I don't think I have enough time to go through them. So if you have, uh, you, if you are interested, you can just uh, uh, go to the supplementary of the paper. So yeah, and the reason we choose to use Gaussian Newton is because it's much faster. Because we ultimately we want to embed this to a SAM system, and here are some. This animation shows the shows how the how the optimization process looks like. So you can see, given uh, like a a coarse estimate of the pose, and also a uh, zero shape code, it is able to to like gradually become better and better. And here's some, yeah, here's some like a zoomed in view of the the, the reconstruction. You, you can see, yeah, you, if you see, if you see carefully, you can see the, yeah, the shape. Yeah, it captures the shape quite well. Yeah, like this one, this red one is, yeah, it's, a, it's like a sedan car. And this, this green one is like an SUV, yeah. And this, yeah, this is a, another better view for you can see the shape is looks quite nice okay and once we've got the uh, got the entire uh, object reconstruction pipeline that is uh, that can capture very very good shape details and is also fast to run then we are able to now we are ready to to come up with a full slam system with this reconstruction pipeline. So the idea is, yeah, it's, it's also quite simple. So for for a newly, uh, for, yeah, for, for all the detections, first we do the data association, you can see here, to, de to, to decide whether this object is, is reconstructed, is observed before or not. If it's a new object, we, we will just run the, run the whole pipeline I've just uh, described. And then after optimization, we will just, uh, Add this as a new object to our map, and if it is a if it is a new observation of a existing object, then we will just uh, then we'll just uh, optimize its uh, pose, just to get a new pose observation and add it to our uh, add it to our joint factor graph. So which is here, so you can see the so this factor graph the the top part is yeah is is is, is exactly the same as any traditional uh, indirect or feature-based SLAM method. It's just a, with where you have uh, you, you have camera poses and uh, map points. But uh, in the bottom part, we also have the object poses. And the object pose, yeah, it can, with, with all those new, like, uh, uh, new pose observations, you can add those as this new edges to this factor graph, and you just uh, join to open with everything, and that's the that's the whole slam pipeline. And and with this backend, we can the good thing is that it can it, it can be it, all the object poses can be refined like a like a can be refined, and also the we are able to uh, once we are able to detect any loops, it is able to. Close that loop, uh, which uh, which I will show you later. It looks quite cool. Yeah. 
yeah, and here's a, I'm gonna show you a very long sequence on KT sequence. And you can see the, the objects. And 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 this is a, this is running in real time. So yeah. And just wait, it will be yeah, it will be faster later. And you will be able to see the loop. Okay, here you already can see that the after long distance there are some error drift, but here it's not a loop, so it's it cannot be corrected. Yeah. But this one you can see it has revisited where it's started, right? And just to, yeah. Yeah, you can see the loop is closed and the duplicated objects are merged. Yeah, and here's another loop. And you can see this map, it's got around like 400 cars. But as we are using a latent code, so 400 cars is very small. Uh, how small is it? So it's, uh, it's 64. Floating point numbers because it's there's the size of latent latent code. Yeah. Huh? Oh, that, that, that's per object. So you multiply that by four hundred. Yeah. But if you use a dense mesh, let's say one car might be like one megabyte. So it might be 40, uh, 64 times 64 times 64. If you use a resolution of 64, right? Yeah, so that's the, that's a good thing. Okay, and uh, yeah, we also have a, so previously, the previous uh, demo we, because we use stereo and also, also we, we use some lighter points on the, on the car, although we, we did not use them for tracking, but we, we, we take some sparse lighter points on the car surface to, for the object recon reconstruction. But here we also show some, that our method can also run on, on mon monocular case. So it's a single moving camera around a chair. And you can see that that's the, yeah, that's the property of monocular slab. The, the scale is your scale ambiguity. So the it's are like stretching. Yeah, now it's uh, stable. And the shape of the chair is, yeah, also converges. Okay, and uh, I think that's it for object slam part. And uh, now let's move on to the last part. Yeah, so 
so we've just uh, we've just been talking about like how to achieve object level understanding of the environment with some pre-trained shape priors. But also sometimes we it's quite important to to have to have dense semantic level understanding, not on the foreground objects, but also for the for all the things and the stuff in the scene. Let's say the floor or the walls. Sometimes it's also important to to know where the floor is. So imagine imagine for autonomous driving, of course, is to detect where the road is is quite important. And so the last section is I'm going to talk about my recent paper on on real time online semantic mapping. Okay, so yeah, so this oh sorry, this video. Yeah, so this video here, uh, you can see it's a it's a very famous work called Semantic Fusion from yeah, from Imperial from Andy's group in 2017, and uh, and since then it has become the I would say the standard paradigm of of doing semantic mapping in robotics community, and uh, I mean its pipeline is quite simple, so. It has two two stages as shown in this this figure on the right. So first you first you run two D uh, you run two D network to get the two D predicted labels, and once you've got the two D predicted labels, you just uh, because there's also a back end slam system running, then you just uh, you kind of do the data data association by back projecting those all those labels to three D, and because we are because here the all the frames comes on the fly, so we also need to to fuse all those observations uh, temporarily. And normally, this is done by some either some heuristics like average pooling or with some like a very simple like Bayesian update, where you just uh, yeah just uh, just assume that that the 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 label of the last time as as a prior estimate, and then once the once the new observation from from the current frame comes in as a likelihood, you just uh, update recursively. And but this pipeline has two issues. First, yeah, first is that the two D network processes each frame separately, so there is no historical or local context information when we predict the two D labels from a single frame, and yeah, which might cause some inconsistency or bad to the labels. And here's an example. You can see the the same cheer, but uh, but they are they are processed like separately. So you you might get you can see. I think this yellow should be cheer, but you get some misclassification here. And the secondly, the entire process doesn't doesn't actually does does consider any three D spatial information because the labels come from on purely 2D or 2.5D information. And the the label transfer is is simply back projection. So the entire process doesn't have any 3D uh, 3D spatial information. And this and this this 3D information has been proven by many uh, offline 3D network based methods have been pro proven to be very important to achieve state of, of the art uh, accuracy. But those 3D information is very hard directly from 2D or 2.5D images. Yeah, and here is yeah, here is this last paper I'm going to present is is to try is trying to solve that two problems. Uh, yeah, it's called Sam Labs. Uh, so the idea is yeah, just to just to address those those two problems separately. And for the first problem, we we proposed a 2D latent prior network. Yeah, that that, that leverages a, a differentiable feature re, feature reprojection to encode some cross frame information, uh, such that we can have a better, more temporal consistent 2D label predictions. And for 3D uh, to encode 3D information, one naive way is to just uh, uh, just uh, is to apply the 3D convolution directly on the dense primitives, whether you are using voxel or point cloud, you just uh, you just uh, apply the 3D convolution directly. But doing so is too computationally expensive. 
and therefore we we decided to leverage a, a what we call a quasi planar over segmentation algorithm to first group to first group the raw raw voxels or raw point clouds into group into into some boundary preserving segments and once we've got those segments we we, we, we are able to like effectively reduce the number of primitives to several million, a million to less than one thousand. Then we can we can apply three D convolution at the segment level, which is much more efficient. And next, I'm going to introduce subblock. Yeah, so the first is this latent prime network. It's just a it's just a standard UNet architecture with. Uh, yeah, if uh, with one or two encoders here. So if you use RGB, if you use RGBD inputs, you can have two encoders. And if you have RGB only, you just take one. And apart from the semantic output, we also we also output the intermediate features, which are used in the reprojection process. And uh, regarding the 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 re reproject process, we just, uh, yeah, at, uh, at the training, uh, yeah, first of all, we train, we train our 2D networks on ScanNet dataset. So at the training time, we, we just sample the, we sample the re reference view and the other N minus one neighboring views. And all those views comes in mini mesh mode. And uh, yeah, we just apply the laws on the, uh, so this L semantic is just the cross central laws on the on the reference view, uh, but also we uh, we also compute the uh, label prediction at uh, the other neighboring views to because we also want to encourage like a very good prediction for for single view. Uh, but but at test time the whole process happens sequentially and we don't need to we, we don't need to like. Uh, Output anything from the neighboring views. We just uh, we just uh, run through the network and uh, output the labels on on the reference view. And uh, yeah, as 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 I said before, we aim to reduce the number of primitives uh, that need to be pr processed by our security network, and for which we we propose our most plan over segmentation method. So basically, it just cluster the rows. Then surface voxels into segments based on based on surface normals, and the entire process is it is running incrementally, which means we don't need to when the map becomes very large we don't need to uh, to run this algorithm from scratch every time we just need to to update the local part that's affected by the by the kernel observation. And once the sec uh, once the segment map is ready, we apply the three D convolution at segment level to get the final refined semantic map. And inspired by point cons, we yeah we we also propose our set con, so which is defined over over the k nearest segment, and it use it uses two MLPs uh, W and Fi, and the the W will just uh, predict the uh, predict the weight, uh, predict the convolutional kernel, and the other MLP just a uh, pro process the input feature vector, and we train our SACOM net on ScanNet as well, and it and, and it uses the Bayesian labeled segments, using the yeah uh, the Bayesian labeled segments with with our latent prime network. Okay, so that's the whole pipeline, and uh, here we we show some comparison against some baseline method. This is on scan at the validation split. And you can see our method sam labs can first it achieves the best result among all the 2D 3D uh, based methods. And it also yeah, it also performs on par with the 3D network based methods. Yeah, but uh, but we can also provide like 2D semantic labeling, which is important for some other robotic tasks. And here, here are some qualitative comparison. You can see that, yeah, you, you, you can see that our methods uh, overall it perform better in classes that rely more on visual features. For example, you can see this refrigerator, this orange, this orange thing, and also the counter, 
uh, the counter is this, yeah, this counter is sh uh, this shallow blue thing. And it's more obvious in the zoomed in view. Yeah. And so in the previous slide, we have seen the results on standard. So, so we're all the method, all, all, all the methods were trained on Scanet and tested on Scanet. But one thing in that Scanet is that is actually captured with Kinect sensors, which has which has very good depth quality. And so another interesting question is how would all those methods transfer to sequences with with the worst depth quality, and which is very common in robotic in actual robotic applications. And uh, to do this experiment, we captured four sequences with real sense T four five five. Yeah, which has, yeah, you can you you can clearly tell that the from the mesh you can see this scanner mesh, and this is the mesh we constructed with the real sense apps. You can see the quality is worse, and we test all and we test the uh, the methods trained on scanet, and here you can see that our our method is able to achieve better across sensor gen generalization. Yeah. So, which is very important for, yeah, for actual practical usage. Yeah, and here's a demo of, of our method running on, on a scan app scene. So you can see it's, a, yeah, it's in incrementally like a build building the semantic map. Yeah, and here's another example on our self-captured uh, sequence with real sense. I think I think that's that's for today. So I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah. Well, one of your demos you for like this trajectory of uh, what seems to be a camera, like going through the scene. Um, how do you how do you get the trajectory? Like how do you get the ground truth? For the That's just the your camera, post, whatever, slam algorithm. Yeah, that's just the trajectory you 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 got on the fly, right? Yeah. In, uh, suppose uh, your vision is let's say you have a couch and you walk around, it, right? Uh, oh, you mean the that one? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a it's just a slam. It is a slam system, so so, so so the trajectory is come out of the algorithm. So not just object, but also uh, camera poses and also the background map point. So you get it for free from uh, using the slam. Yeah. You just not, I'm not going to slam the trunks. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the definition of slam, right? Simultaneous localization and mapping. So localization means to to ask so all those is. Yeah, the pose is estimated on the fly. Uh, I think one of your last slides comparison to different objects. Different and, objects. Uh, your system seemed to perform very well on, I think it was Windows was one of the last. Columns. Oh yeah, this one. Is that uh, was that talking about? Was that just talking about the frames or the actual glass itself? The thing uh, is, uh, I would say it's it should be frame because because imagine on the glass there are no depths, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think there are in terms of the labeling. I think Scanet is not perfect. It's just, yeah. okay. Can you paint the people with the cars and the shapes? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, when you're, when you're building the map and then you can turn around and you're building, uh, suppose you've got a hidden code which allows you to fit some pre existing shape yeah. to the current observation. Mm -hmm. um, do you assume that you have all the, the possible shapes that you can encounter? Uh, well, it's, it's already learning to pass that. Sorry, what? It's already, already learned in the past step. So the past step, you can regard it as a generative model. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you would generate the correct shape yeah. what you see. Yeah. Okay. And you just optimize the shape code. Yeah. Because everything is fully differentiable. You just get the gradient and optimize. Yeah. You, uh, you said you think you've got a real time. What kind of hardware do you see actually going to I mean, there's the ASP stamp. Yeah, that's uh, it's uh, I think it was in 2021. I was using a single 2080, yeah, with a eight gig, and it's a laptop version, so it's, it's yeah, hmm? both <laughs> the network part is Python, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of engineering details, yeah. The, yeah, I'd be more than happy if you can start my GitHub repo. <laughs> yeah. 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 What are you going to do now? Now? Well, like now you finish your PhD. Oh, yeah, writing thesis. I'm going to stop finding a job. Yeah. And, so. and, 